In today's lecture, we will be continuing in the topic uh, of uh, pressure sensors as uh, we have discussed last week. And uh, today we'll be talking about uh, sensors for pressure that are used in industrial systems. Uh, last week we've been talking about the uh, definition pressure gauges. So we have seen that uh, if our pressure sensor uses uh, the definition of pressure, then uh, I can use it to calibrate all other instruments. However, we have seen that uh, this principle is uh, very fragile and uh, it's not robust enough uh, for usage in industrial systems. So uh, the instruments that we have seen last week were used especially in labs to calibrate all other instruments. On the other hand, in industrial systems you need uh, to have pressure gauges that uh, are quite robust. So uh, they are fine with vibrations, they are fine with uh, temperature changes, uh, with um, dirt and so on. So for this reason we need to use a different principle. And uh, industrial pressure gauges they use deformation. So uh, we change the shape of some element, for example a diaphragm or uh, anything else. And uh, this change of shape is uh, proportional to the pressure that we measure. So we will need to know something about uh, how to measure the deformation or how to measure force. And uh, that will be the topic of uh, today's lecture. So all the pressure gauges that we will see today will be based on deformation of something. You also need to know that uh, this principle, this deformation of uh, an element is not uh, what we consider the definition of pressure because uh, we have defined that pressure is a force that acts on some given area or with the hydrostatic pressure. So uh, we will not be able to use deformation manometers as a definition, so we can't use them for primary calibration. So for primary calibration, that was uh, the pressure gauges that we've discussed last week, and today we'll be talking about uh, the other principles. So the definition gauges that we've seen last week were very accurate. We have seen the accuracy was uh, well below 0.01%. In industrial systems, you typically do not need this grade of accuracy. So we are fine with if we have 0.5 or 0.8 or 0.3% of accuracy. So typical, the deformation manometers, they have a lower accuracy, about an order of magnitude lower. Let's take a look on the first device that uh, is uh, quite often used. Now this pressure gauge is based on a burden element. I will probably start not with this picture but uh, maybe with uh, this photographs. Uh, we can see a burden element here on this picture. A burden element is nothing else than a tube that has been flattened and uh, this tube is changing its shape with the pressure. So what we are doing is that uh, we connect the measured pressure on one side of the tube. Now of course the other end is sealed and if the internal pressure is increasing the Bourdon tube tries to straighten itself like this and we are detecting the change of shape of this Bourdon tube. Now what you see on this picture is uh, when the Bourdon tube is first produced it's like a tube like this that is flat but then there are other manufacturing steps that follow. So uh, we need to seal the end of uh, 
the boolean tube and we need to uh, mount all this in an assembly of the pressure gauge. We can see the assembly for example here on the picture on the very right. So this is the Bourdon tube. In this case it is made from brass and uh, here at this end the tube is sealed hermetically and here we can see a set of levers that transfer the motion to a needle. And a needle is uh, connected here on this shaft that is exactly in the middle. So when this end of the Bourdon tube is moving like that, with increasing pressure or with decreasing pressure it would move like this, then through these levers and through a gear mechanism the motion is being transferred to a needle and then on a needle you see what is your measured pressure. So if we show this, let's say, uh, in, in, as a principle on a picture, it looks like this. We have the connected pressure that we want to measure. We connect that with a tube to the Bourdon element. And the Bourdon element can be a tube like you have seen uh, in the picture, like a half circle, or it could be also a spiral. And the end here is connected through a mechanical transmission of uh, levers and uh, gears to a scale and here we can see the reading. Uh, this is the tube shape that uh, is typical. So it's, uh, it starts as a tube and then it's being flattened to this flat shape. The tube is made typically from brass or bronze or for higher pressures it is made from steel. Now, there is a very nice fabrication video it takes about five minutes that uh, shows us how this is manufactured. So take a look at home on this video, it's quite nice. You can see the manufacturing steps uh, of uh, this uh, Bourdon element pressure gauge. Uh, the Bourdon gauge has several advantages. First of all, it is very robust. So it can work with environments where you have vibrations, it can uh, withstand uh, changes of temperature, it can work in dirty environment and so on. It also does not require any electrical energy. So we can directly read the number from the scale and uh, we don't need any battery but on the other hand uh, we also do not have any remote signal from this gauge so this means that uh, the Bourdon element pressure gauges are used locally in your application where you need to measure the pressure but uh, you do not have a signal that you can connect for example to a control system that controls your process. Of course you could uh, sense the position of the needle, you could uh, position, sense, uh, you, could, you could measure the position with the camera and so on. So it is doable but uh, typically it's not done because uh, it would be too complicated and there are other principles when you require an electrical output. The accuracy class is uh, typically above one percent and accuracy class means that when the needle is at full scale so for example on this gauge it would be in here this would be the position of the needle then when the instrument is calibrated the maximum relative error is one uh, percent now typically one percent would be very precise for a Bruton element meter it typically is something like two maybe five percent so it's not that accurate but uh, it is quite sufficient to locally show you what pressure you need the Bruton element can work uh, as uh, an absolute pressure gauge or as a pressure difference meter the instruments that you see here and uh, here are for absolute pressure so it means that we have one input for the pressure here and here 
and uh, we measure this pressure directly we see the number on the on the scale on the other hand the pressure gauge here in the middle is uh, for pressure difference you can see here that we have two bourdon tubes one in here and one in there and uh, at the end they are connected together and together they move through the set of levers and gears the needle and here from the back or from the bottom uh, we would have uh, two connectors to connect uh, two pressures so if uh, our pressures are the same then we will not see any reading on the needle the same pressures that means that uh, the pressure difference is zero when one pressure is increasing then it will try to straighten the tube and the, the other pressure is constant then this movement will be visible on the needle so the bourdon element principle is uh, quite universal and uh, you can build differential pressure gauges as well with this principle Now let's move on to something that will have an electrical output. And uh, those will be pressure gauges with a diaphragm. And the diaphragm is uh, the most common type of pressure gauges used in industrial sensors. The principle is shown on this picture. You can see that uh, we have a diaphragm. This is this part of uh, the device and uh, we are applying pressure on one side of the diaphragm and when P is uh, larger than the reference pressure then it's clear that the deformation of the diaphragm will look like this and we need to sense the shape or the deformation of uh, this diaphragm so for this reason we have what's called a piezo-resistive element this is acting like a strain gauge and measures the deformation of our diaphragm so you could do this also with uh, normal strain gauges if you would glue them on uh, some diaphragm from metal for example the reference pressure is uh, sealed during the manufacturing process so uh, what you see here is an absolute pressure sensor but it can very easily be working also as a pressure difference meter you simply here leave an opening here and this would uh, connect to another pressure that we could call maybe P1 and this would be P2 so then in this case this would be the pressure difference sensor the piezo-resistive elements are typically connected in a bridge so you can see the electrical connection here on the right hand side you can see that uh, we have uh, four pressure sensitive or resistors and uh, they are connected in a Wheatstone bridge now the output signal is here in the middle that's uh, what is going to our meter and uh, here is our power supply voltage and you can see that uh, the piezo-resistive elements are arranged in such a way that uh, two of them are increasing their resistance with pressure that's R4 and R3 and two of them are decreasing its resistance with uh, increasing pressure this is done uh, with uh, the mechanical arrangement on the diaphragm so you can see here that R3 and R4 are in the middle and uh, R2 and uh, R1 are on the sides of the resistor. Now there is a very nice animation on this web page that you can take a look. I recommend you to play a little bit with this animation. Uh, you will see how the pressure is changing and uh, here you will see the deformation of the diaphragm and you will see the different resistances here in the bridge. So, uh, the industrial sensors with electrical output typically use 
some similar principle to this one. So we have some element that is changing the shape. It's typically a diaphragm and some sensors that sense the deformation. We can do it, of course, not only with uh, the strain gauges, as we've seen on the last picture, but uh, we can do it also, for example, with a capacitive position sensor. And that's what you can see here on this picture. You can see we have a diaphragm on the left and we apply pressure to this diaphragm. So when I apply pressure, then the diaphragm will do this basically, to change shape like that. And through this rod that is in the middle, this deformation of the diaphragm will be transferred to a set of electrodes that's here on the right hand side. One set of the electrodes is connected to the rod directly. That's the set that is here on the left side. And so when the rod is moving to the right, then also the set of electrodes is moving to the right. The second set of electrodes is fixed. And it is fixed to a cover. So uh, when there is motion like this with the electrodes, it means that we are changing the area here in our capacitor. Now, in principle, it could work also with a single electrode, but uh, since the dielectric material in here is air, typically, then uh, we need uh, to have a uh, larger area if we want to have a capacity that is uh, possible to measure with a good degree of accuracy. We know that uh, capacitance depends on uh, the material dielectric, so epsilon. I will write that uh, only as epsilon, but uh, it's uh, epsilon zero times epsilon r, where epsilon zero is the permittivity of vacuum, and uh, epsilon r is the relative permittivity of my material. But for air, it is uh, very close to one. It's 1.000 something. Then the capacity depends also on the area of my capacitor, so A. This is what is changing with uh, my changes of pressure. And then it depends on the distance between the electrodes, so it's divided by D. But uh, D is, uh, the, is a constant value, so uh, we can see that we have A multiplied by some constant. So this gives us a nice linear dependence between capacity and area and uh, all this is directly proportional to my pressure P1 that I measure in here. So in reality this device can look for example like this. You can see here on the left side this is the diaphragm in here so we can see it has a shape like this so it can easily deform now this is the rod that's in the middle and this is moving very slightly to the right by increasing the input pressure and in here you can see the set of electrodes so on the right this is the fixed set of electrodes and on the left, this is uh, the movable set of electrons. So when I apply pressure to this diaphragm, it changes its shape very slightly. It pushes this rod and this pushes the set of the electrons. The movement is uh, very small. In reality, this size of this gap from zero, from zero pressure to maximum pressure now this is roughly one millimeter. So uh, we need to have a sensitive circuit that is able to read the small capacity changes that we have here on the electrodes. But it's doable. It's uh, read through this connector into this electronic circuit. And then uh, on the output, you have uh, typically a current signal uh, from 4 to 20 milliamperes that uh, gives you the pressure that you have on the input. 
So this is a view inside of uh, an industrial pressure sensor that is based on the diaphragm, which we have here, and uh, based on capacitive sensing. Uh, when it's assembled, it uh, typically looks like this. Now this picture is not from this specific type of uh, pressure gauge. However, this is also uh, a pressure gauge that is used in industrial systems. And it is a capacitive based sensor. So at the end here we have a diaphragm and uh, in here we are detecting the changes of capacity. And in this uh, cylinder uh, there will be the electronic circuit uh, similar to this one which uh, is uh, creating the output signal. Now this is uh, equipped also with a display so you can read the pressure locally but uh, it has also an industrial grade current output or ethernet output whatever you need uh, to provide uh, some connection to a computer system. In this picture you can see an example how an individual sensor can look like. I will start from the one on the right side here. Now this is an industrial grade sensor. Again all those are capacitive based and you can see here we have the input port. So uh, you uh, use this thread to connect it somewhere in your application whatever you need to measure the pressure. And there is a diaphragm, probably somewhere around here. And then there will be a circuit in here uh, that is evaluating the changes of the capacity. And then the output connector allows you to connect it, whatever you need. The pictures on the left and in the middle, they show us uh, individual sensors. If, for example, you need to mount them in your own application. Uh, they are typically used in the automotive industry as, uh, for example, pressure sensors for the wheels. So they can be embedded in the wheel and uh, they can sense the pressure that you have in the tire. But they are used also for many other applications. We know that uh, the height above sea level is dependent also on the pressure. So if you want to measure what if you are uh, in a plane for example and uh, if you want to measure what is your current altitude then you can use atmospheric pressure for that. And that's also one use of those sensors as you can see here. Now some of those sensors are de measuring directly the barometric pressure so they are measuring only a single pressure with respect to some reference pressure that is inside. Some other types may have two ports on both sides and uh, they can give you uh, pressure difference. So uh, then it would look uh, like this. So for example here you would have one port on one side, you would connect one pipe from the left and then from the other side there would be another port like that and you would connect uh, another pressure. So this, so that would be the sensor for pressure difference. In all cases the accuracy of uh, those sensors is approximately 1.5 percent. This is like an estimate. But you can of course find sensors that are somewhat, somewhat more accurate and uh, also some more that are less accurate. So it depends really on whatever you need for your application. If you require a really high accuracy uh, and uh, maybe a robust industrial solution, then uh, you will probably need a sensor like this. If you are building your own application, such uh, as an altitude meter, for example, or a barometric pressure sensor for your home, then you might use something like this that is directly mounted on a printed circuit board. Uh, here are a few pictures how such sensors look inside. 
those are reference from um, some uh, research papers again you can find uh, the source here in this link and uh, I, I found it quite interesting that uh, it's so small and uh, it can be integrated uh, in an integrated circuit so here on the left we can see an example of a diaphragm so that's it's here this area is our diaphragm now if you cut through that you can see that this is the diaphragm here and uh, it's when when you apply pressure it's basically doing this of course this is exaggerated deformation uh, it's all made from silicon and uh, they will have directly some way how the deformation is measured either with uh, some uh, capacitive sensing or with some piezo resist elements on the diaphragm you can see approximately the scale so they can they see, say here well for example this uh, one part is 75 micrometers so the whole diameter of this would be I would say maybe uh, maybe how many parts one two three four five six seven eight nine ten so let's say let's say under one millimeter definitely the size of, uh, of this diaphragm we can we can see here uh, another example on the right it's approximately having the same size the diaphragm here has a uh, little bit more than one millimeter now in most cases uh, it measures not only the pressure or pressure difference but uh, it gives us also a temperature reading uh, for example if you are building uh, an altitude meter this is quite useful because uh, you want to get the pressure and temperature as well and then by using the standard atmosphere model you can calculate what is your altitude so uh, in most cases this uh, sensor integrates also a, pre a temperature sensor and that's what, what we see here on the picture on the right so here we have a diaphragm and uh, here we have a platinum sensor that is used for temperature sensing now note that they have approximately the same size they are both rectangular but that's not quite important uh, so in total this will be integrated on the chip uh, with some electrical circuits that uh, will allow us to read the signal from the pressure and from the temperature sensor so in most cases for example this type of sensor that you see here it has some form of digital bus so uh, for example this case this sensor has uh, i square c bus so uh, you can read it uh, directly with a microcontroller and uh, you can uh, get uh, all the data that you require as numbers on some digital bus but some other pressure gauges based on on this principle they will have uh, an analog output for example as a, as a voltage um, now let me compare what uh, pressure ranges can we achieve with uh, what principle in this table you see such a comparison we did definitely not discuss all the principles because there are many many principles used for pressure we have discussed only the Bourdon element here which is the very first one we have discussed uh, the diaphragm and uh, more specifically the capacitive diaphragm which is here and uh, basically that's about it so you can see we have discussed just two principles but there are many many more in this columns we can see the pressure range where this gauge can measure and uh, in here we can see also the let's say more general principle so about the first half of uh, the table that's mechanical gauges then we have thermal gauges that, that use the change of uh, heat dissipation to measure pressure and then the last group is ionization you can see that uh, the Bourdon element and capacitive diaphragms operate in the higher pressure ranges 
this is 1000 and uh, this is 10 to the power of minus 5 so the capacitive diaphragm it's quite okay it uh, covers a very broad range in uh, higher pressures if we look on the burden element it is good for higher pressures but it's not able to measure low pressures the, the, the reason is simple for low pressures the deformation would be very small and we would not see that deformation on the scale so capacitive diaphragm is uh, today one of the most commonly used principle for pressure sensing in industrial systems at least for higher pressures now if we are looking for lower pressures near vacuum you can see that we need to use something completely different and uh, this is typically based on ionization so if your pressure is something like um, 200 kilopascals or or 2 megapascals then you will definitely select a capacitive meter if you're looking for one pascal or, or some low pressures like that you will need to use a different principle such like this one now we will not discuss the other principles uh, but uh, just uh, remember that they exist and that they are there are many principles of uh, pressure sensing now at the end let me explain you how to install pressure sensors properly in an application because every time when you install a sensor it's not uh, just uh, the sensor type that you select what is important but uh, it is also the correct installation so it means that you can completely ruin your properties of uh, your meter if you not install it correctly and uh, this applies in general it does not apply only to pressure sensors it applies to temperature it applies to flow it applies to all uh, all variables that you can measure so uh, you uh, buy a meter that has a really good accuracy and then you just install it in a wrong position for example and uh, this uh, will decrease your accuracy or it will make completely impossible to get uh, a correct reading so what is important for placing correctly the pressure sensors first of all you need to watch for everything that is changing the pressure and pressure profile so uh, it can be a valve for example which you see here on uh, the left so you should not install a pressure gauge near a valve it could be a flap which you see here in the middle this flap will again change the pressure distribution in your pipe and uh, it can be also a bending so even if you bend a pipe like this you will see that uh, there is different pressure that you measure at this point different pressure at this point and different pressure at that point of course the pressure differences will be very small because the pressure loss will be quite low but uh, if you want to make accurate measurements it's important to place the meter so that it measures what you want it to measure so let's take a look on few examples how we can correctly install such pressure gauges we will start with a clean medium by this I mean either clean gas or a clean liquid so in other words it's a clean fluid there are no impurities uh, no extra particles uh, no gas as bubbles in this system so here we have a pipe and uh, we want to sense the pressure in this pipe so typically you drill a hole in the pipe wall like this the pipe diameter is uh, around one millimeter and then you attach your probe in there 
Now the meter can sit either directly on top of uh, this attachment or uh, it can go with uh, with some smaller pipe and here you could have uh, your gauge somewhere where uh, you can actually install it. Now remember that we need to make sure that uh, there is nothing that's changing the pressure near our probe point. So uh, there is like a general rule of thumb and it's saying that uh, you need to keep at least 10 pipe diameters from anything that's changing the pressure. So this could be a valve, this could be a bending for example. So if uh, we have a valve like that somewhere in our pipe then this distance between the valve and this probing point should be at least 10 pipe diameters. Now uh, when we will be discussing uh, flow sensors based on pressure measurements you will see that even 10 times pipe diameter might not be sufficient and you may go to numbers for example like 50 or 60 pipe diameters so uh, if uh, we use pressure gauges to measure flow then this will be even a bigger number now keep also in mind that this small opening will work only if you really have a clean medium. If uh, you have some impurities they could block this uh, opening and then your measurement is ruined. Now how should the connection look like between the probing point and uh, between the pressure gauge? Now typically if it's installed locally uh, you do not connect directly the meter just uh, to this uh, to this probe attachment because uh, of maintenance if for some reason you need to remove the meter for calibration or for 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 checking uh, you would just disconnect the meter and your your medium that you measure would escape so uh, the typical connection is shown in this diagram now we typically have a valve here that is sitting at our probe attachment. Now this is a special kind of valve, full flow valve, that uh, will not uh, be used to control the flow. So this is either fully closed or fully open. So this allows us to disconnect the rest of the system from our pipe. Then at the highest point in our system we have another valve that is allowed that is there to allow the air to escape so it's sitting at the highest point for example if this would be a liquid with uh, eventually some bubbles then the bubbles would accumulate at the highest place which would be there and you could release them with this valve Otherwise, uh, they would block the pressure transfer between the liquid that's filling the, this pipe and between your pressure gauge. So this on top is the air escape valve. And then this pipe continues to your meter. The connection of this pipe and the diameter of this pipe is typically somewhere in the range between 6 and uh, 10 millimeters and uh, it has typically an inclination of about 1 to 20. Now it has an inclination because we want that this is the highest point so that all the eventual air bubbles will accumulate at this position and uh, this will be the lowest point where we will be able to eventually drain some impurities. So at the lowest point here, we have another valve, a third one, that uh, is uh, there to remove the eventual impurities from this piping system. And then this is our gauge. This could be a burden element. This could be a capacitive uh, industrial sensor. It could be anything you, you require. So this is how to install correctly uh, such a system. 
Uh, now, uh, there are many cases when uh, we have, for example, hot vapors. And in hot vapors, we need to cool down the vapor so that the higher temperatures would not damage our pressure gauge. So for this, we use something that's called a vapor condensation loop. You can see my probe attachment in here. This is the pipe. Of course, I omitted here the, the valves for simplicity, but you will typically have at least one valve here so that you can uh, close all this. And then you will have another valves uh, to remove eventual impurities and so on. And uh, your meter would be somewhere here. And this condensation loop allows uh, the medium here to cool down and uh, the pressure will still be transferred to your pressure gauge. Now this is the arrangement for a horizontal pipe, but uh, you can see it's very similar also for the vertical pipe, which is here we have the probe attachment, we have also a vapor condensation loop, and we have a valve that allows us to close the entire assembly, and then here we would have uh, the pressure gauge to measure our pressure. So this is for vapors. Uh, very often we also need to measure pressure for an aggressive liquid or a gas. So in this case uh, we need to protect the pressure gauge from chemical damage. And uh, one way how to do it is uh, shown on those two pictures. So we can protect uh, the system with another liquid that uh, will not damage the system. The condition here is that uh, the liquid will not mix with our liquid. And it will need to have a different density. So the two pictures that you see here are for the case when my separation liquid has a lower density than my measured liquid. And uh, the picture on the right is for the case when my measured liquid has lower density than my separation liquid. In both cases, we have a small tank. And in both cases, we have the connections uh, between the gauge and between the probe somewhere in our application. So remember that this works only when the two liquids are not mixing together. So for example, this could be water and oil. So uh, the separation liquid would be oil. It would sit on top of our water. And uh, here it would not mix together. So here we will have some interface between the materials, but the liquids will not, will not uh, uh, mix together. So when I change pressure of my measured liquid in here, this pressure is being transferred to my separation liquid and then to my gauge, which is somewhere there. And the same is uh, shown here uh, on the right, where uh, we have uh, the pressure sensor on the bottom, because here for this case, the separation liquid has actually a higher density than my measured liquid. Uh, this will work only when the two liquids are not mixing together. If they are mixing together here, uh, you, you could add a flexible diaphragm, for example, from rubber or from silicon. And this diaphragm will, uh, sorry, this diaphragm will do something like this or like that if the pressure is changing. And then you, you have a completely sealed system and uh, you don't need to, to care about uh, the mixing of the two liquids together. So this is a system that is used for aggressive liquids and of course it's working also for gases. And the very last slide is uh, an example how we can use air or water as our separation liquid. So on the left side here you can see an example of water. We have a pipe with our measured medium. This might be for example some gas that we want to measure. And uh, this entire system 
is filled with water. We connect some water from source of water that needs to be under pressure. And this pressure is slightly larger than the pressure of our medium in the pipe. And uh, here we see the meter, we see the valve so that we can disconnect everything from the system. And uh, we provide water, it's uh, flowing a little bit in our, in our pipe, it's filling this entire system and it's filling also this, uh, this pipe that is going to the meter. So uh, if the pressure of our gas is changing, then uh, it will be transferred through this pipe to the meter. But uh, since all this is filled with water, uh, the measured medium will not enter into the system and will not damage it. This does not have to be a gas, uh, it, can be, it can be a liquid, for example. Of course, the disadvantage is that uh, your measured medium is slightly contaminated with this water. And then it's uh, a question if uh, this is allowed of, uh, the, the, by the conditions uh, of, uh, of your process. And a similar example is shown here on the right. This is shown where we have air as uh, our separation liquid. So here we see that uh, the whole system is uh, filled with air that comes from some source, that a compressor for example, a regulation valve, and uh, then it's going into the pipe. This is a gas, so um, it's uh, connected on top so that all this is connected on top and uh, if uh, there will be eventual bubbles then they will form on the top here uh, when we have a liquid it's uh, connected from the bottom of your pipe uh, it works in the same way like uh, we have uh, for water so we fill this whole system with gas with air uh, and uh, if uh, the pressure here is changing the pressure that we measure is transferred to our gauge and we can actually measure that and here also the measured medium is contaminated slightly with the air so again it's a question for the process engineer that will tell you if this is uh, possible or if you need to use some other gauge that, uh, that measures the pressure with some other principle. Okay, that's it for today. We did not fail the whole time, uh, but uh, that's all for pressure gauges.